Jesus Christ, TNA. How many people were at Bound for Glory? 86? I swear to God, WWE has more employees at any TV show or pay-per-view taping than TNA has fans at their pay-per-views. I thought Bound for Glory was one of TNA's biggest pay-per-views. It was right here in my city. We're the eighth largest city in the United States, and that's what they draw? Are you fucking kidding me? TNA is a goddamn joke. I credit them. They're actually one of the reasons why I first came up here and started doing commentaries in the first place because I was fucking mind-fucked by the decision that they decided to bring in Eric Bischoff and Hulk Hogan. I said from day one that that will be the death of them. They are going outside of their comfort zone. They are changing their identity. Part of the reason why TNA had any success at all is for the reason that I've said over a hundred times doing these commentaries, and that is that they tried to be an alternative to WWE. Let's give these fans that are sick and tired of sports entertainment, that are sick and tired of the hokey angles and the stupid shit and all the nonsense that WWE does. They're sick of the PG. They're sick of John Cena. They're sick of everything that the WWE is geared towards. And they want to give the wrestling fans, the old Attitude Era fans, maybe the old ECW fans, fans that just appreciate wrestling a little bit more, they want to give those fans something that they can turn over to when they are sick and tired of the WWE. And the idea worked for about an hour until TNA fucked it up. But when you put two good wrestlers in the ring and have them have a good match, you know, that's what TNA was trying to build themselves on good athletic competition. They used to be proud of their product. They used to be fearless of the WWE. Remember when they took the cookies to the fucking show and all that? You know, it seems like they were always antagonizing them. Uh, they were attacking them. They even had the balls to go head to head with them. But once Hogan and Bischoff got there, then what you're now doing is you're now mimicking the WWE. You're trying to do something that a company is doing a million times better than you. I mean, look, why did WCW start winning in the ratings? Why did they start demolishing the WWE on Monday nights? Part of it was because of Ted Turner's huge wallet, but the other part of it was because they were showing the fans something that they haven't seen before. They were showing the fans something different, and a lot of the people that were sick and tired of what the WWE was doing, Kevin Nash and Scott Hall and the NWO and that whole big storyline that they did was so new and it was so fresh and was so different, and it gave the fans something else to lay their eyes on. It was very, very appealing, and the ratings showed it. But that was it. Because before they got there, what was WCW doing? The same thing TNA is doing, trying to mimic the WWE, doing the same type of storylines, using the same type of wrestlers, just doing everything that they did. It wasn't until Scott Hall and Kevin Nash got over there that the ratings really took a jump and the entire world was captivated. Because before that, it was fucking Hogan and Savage and Elizabeth's high heel shoe and the fucking Dungeon of Doom. I don't know how anybody could have ever watched that shit. Uh, instead of WWE, but WCW was winning in the ratings prior to the NWO, just not, they just weren't destroying the WWE in the ratings like after the NWO got there. ECW, same thing. I don't know if ECW ever became necessarily bigger than TNA, but I think they had the respect of the fans a lot more than TNA. You can debate the hardcore style all you want, whether it was good or whether it was bad. Bottom line is it was something different, it was alternative, it was, it was edgy, and it worked. TNA not having the ability to ignore the WWE and just concentrate on what they're doing. I mean, how many times do you see the WWE mocking TNA or antagonizing them or bringing them up on their TV show or trying to do something like them, you know, blatantly in front of the fans or anything like that? They don't even fucking acknowledge that they exist. They don't give a shit about TNA. It's completely the other way around to TNA. It seems like they hang on WWE's every word and they have tried so hard to do the same thing that the WWE is doing and that's just gonna fucking kill your fan base and it proves it with this fucking pay-per-view. Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff have brought nothing to that company. It's been four years now, count them, four, since they were announced to be coming into TNA. And from day one, I said, where does this put TNA in the future? One year from now, two years from now, three years from now, are they going to sell out 20,000 seat arenas? Are they going to have big pay-per-view buy rates? Is their TNA Impact show on Monday nights going to actually be some sort of competition for Raw? Fuck no. They never had a chance. They blew it the minute it, they turned into a miniature WWE. That's all TNA is. They abandoned their identity, they abandoned their core fan base, and they abandoned their complete philosophy of what they want their wrestling company to be. They flushed it down the toilet to be a smaller version of the WWE to do the same type of stuff. They're not edgy, they're not alternative, they're not different. They're the same fucking shit. Are you fucking surprised that they drew that shit for a pay-per-view? I'm sure the matches were good. I have no fucking idea what even happened on the show. Actually, I do. I do know AJ Styles did win the, uh, the TNA title. Good for him, but fuck, is TNA going to be around much longer after this? You already hear the rumblings of their financial problems. Look at their, what would, they probably lost money on Bound for Glory. It, it probably cost them more money to rent that building and produce the show than it did, than they got off ticket sales and pay-per-view for that matter. I mean, it was just, ugh. So for me, I don't give a shit about TNA, but so many people wanted me to comment 
comment on the shitty fucking crowd for Bound for Glory. I mean, the show might have been good. That's fine. If the TNA wants to go back to that, give the fans good wrestling in small arenas in front of two or 300 people, they can be very successful. ECW was. But TNA has got to let go of this dream that they can somehow, someday, be a true competitor for WWE. They are fucking kidding themselves, and so are the fans. I mean, how the fuck are they supposed to pay Hulk Hogan? Don't they really want to re-sign him? Don't they really want to bring him back in? Let him the fuck go. It'll be the best thing that has ever happened to you. Get your fucking shit together. Screw your goddamn heads on straight. And why don't you get back to what made you moderately successful in the first place? The fans claim to want wrestling. So why don't you do what Ring of Honor does, but just do it on a bigger level with a little bit more recognizable names? The AJs, the Rudes, the fucking Sabins, the X Division guys, you know, build your company around that and then if the fans still don't give a shit and they don't care about that either then it just exposes the fans for being the hypocrites that i've always known that they are and it'll put tna out of business finally something that i have always known is an inevitability ah tna you guys are fucking pathetic let's move on to some good wrestling monday night raw the crowd was dead but there were two pretty good matches on the show involving the main event participants in hell in the cell dolph ziggler took on randy orton and uh, daniel bryan took on dean ambrose i thought were both were great matches and it gave both the guys a win leading into their big title match. I'm going to give you some predictions here. I'm going to make this quick. I don't want to have too long of a commentary this week because I've really been working hard on the 100 question commentary for the end of the year and I'm really into it this week and I'm making progress. So it's coming along nicely. But as far as Raw goes last night, the go home show to hell in the cell, I didn't think it was really that great, but I did like the two matches, the two good wrestling matches that we had on the show. The contract signing was eh, okay. I mean, ugh. The big show, isn't he fired? You know, first he's on live via satellite on the Titan Tron. So I guess that means anybody can get on the Titan Tron. Maybe Chavo Guerrero or somebody else that's been released in the last year or two can come up there and say, hey, Triple H, you piece of shit. You fired me, but I'm still on your show and I still got fucking theme music and all that. So Big Show comes out and uh, just has a little co- Titan Tron promo uh, against Stephanie and Triple H, who, uh, again, I got to say, are doing a great job uh, of being assholes. Just having Stephanie and Triple H in the ring together as heels, insulting everybody, you know, fucking flaunting their power, holding hands, kissing. Uh, It's just enough to, you know, fucking infuriate the fans. So the storyline, I think, is working wonderfully. They announced they're going to have the contract signing later on in the night between Daniel Bryan and Randy Orton. Here we go, another fucking contract signing. So at least we know uh, that there's going to be some physicality at the end of the night. Bryan and Orton both have their matches uh, throughout the duration of the show. CM Punk uh, does a little more work with uh, Paul Heyman, furthering that storyline into the big Hell in the Cell match this week. Biggie Langston is now a babyface. He teamed up with CM Punk uh, to take on Ryback and Axel, and it looks like CM Punk has found himself an ally, and Ryback has found himself a future opponent. And then the main event was the contract signing with uh, Randy Orton and Daniel Bryan. Uh, Triple H and Stephanie and Sean are all in there. They're all putting in their two cents. Triple H is just burying the shit out of uh, Daniel Bryan. You were never a star. You're never as big as me or Rock or Austin or anybody else. You're just a little tiny pink shirt wearing goat face little fucker and I hate you and I don't want you to win my title and you're never going to be the face of my company. Yada, 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 yada. Then Sean jumps in trying to defend Daniel Bryan. Hey, what do you have against him? Why don't you shut the fuck up? You know, but still remaining, uh, you know, close with Triple H at the same time makes you wonder which way Sean's going to go in this thing. And then as soon as we're about to have some sort of a little fight, then you hear some sort of a horn honking and the big show is driving a fucking Mack truck into the goddamn building. He's driving all through the backstage area just like Austin did with a Zamboni. He fucking finds his way out to the ring the whole goddamn thing was done just to distract Randy Orton long enough for Daniel Bryan to hit the double knees to the face or whatever the fuck that finisher is. He lays out Randy Orton, runs out to the truck with Big Show, stands on top of it, and you get the yes, 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 show goes off the air, and here comes Hell in the Cell. Let's do some quick predictions. I'll start right with the main event because we're on the subject of Randy Orton and Daniel Bryan anyway. You know, I've kind of changed my tune. Last week I was kind of thinking that, you know, Randy Orton comes out of this pay-per-view with the belt. You know, makes you wonder about the outcome of the match a little bit. Shawn Michaels is involved. I've been saying, you know, just be patient. Daniel Bryan's moment is coming. I actually thought it was going to be a little bit later than this. I thought maybe his moment would be at Survivor Series or something like that. But we might be looking at some team matchups come Survivor Series. Maybe some team Shawn Michaels versus team Triple H's and shit like that. And I would really like to see Triple H and Stephanie start having more conflicts with other wrestlers other than Daniel Bryan, namely maybe even CM Punk. I think he would fit in great with this. And also the John Cena, Alberto Del Rio outcome, I think also has a lot to do with this. And I also think it would be a really intriguing notion, something that I mentioned before, that I know a lot of fans, especially Daniel Bryan lovers and John Cena haters, are just going to hate. But it is very possible that John Cena and Randy Orton could both walk out of hell in the cell as world champions. 
But my prediction, I'm reversing my prediction. I'm actually going to predict Daniel Bryan. I am going to hope for the sake of logic that the WWE is thinking the same thing I am. Whatever they want to do with John Cena, fine. If they want to give him the belt and all of that, but I don't want them, I don't want John Cena's involvement in Hell in the Cell to affect all of the hard work that they put into the Daniel Bryan storyline. I would hate to have them say to themselves, well, we're going to give John Cena the belt uh, against Alberto Del Rio, so maybe we'll hold off Daniel Bryan's moment uh, another month because we don't want to have, you know, who's going to steal the spotlight from who here? Basically meaning you don't want to give Daniel Bryan his big moment. He finally wins the title on the very same show that John Cena also won a title. So you got to keep that in consideration. So I think a lot of you guys are going to be surprised at a couple of my predictions, but I am going to predict that Daniel Bryan finally gets his moment in Hell in the Cell. Uh, like I said, I thought it would be saved for a bigger pay-per-view, but all the components are there. You got Shawn Michaels involved. You got Daniel Bryan being constantly screwed over by the authority, which I guess they're being called now. He won the title at SummerSlam just to have it taken away. He won the title at Night of Champions just to have it taken away. And his third title match at Battleground was completely ruined. So now he's in the hell in the cell. He's got the guy who trained him as the referee, a guy that has a lot of history with Randy Orton and a lot of history with Triple H and Stephanie. There's a cage. There's a roof on it. He knows Shawn Michaels isn't going to screw him over so what is stopping him from winning what kind of tricks does triple h have up his sleeve and how is daniel bryan going to counter those tricks so i think it's going to be really interesting how they book the match how they write it out and i'm actually pretty excited to see what kind of an outcome they can come up with if i had to guess i think it would be something along the lines of Shawn michaels super kicking randy orton i kind of mentioned last time would Shawn michaels turn heel would he turn heel on daniel bryan i don't think so Shawn michaels has every intention of staying retired he doesn't want to wrestle anymore and for something like that to happen you know, when you have a, you know, an incident like that, a big time screw over that, uh, you know, and titles are at stake and Shawn Michaels turns heel, stuff like that, storylines like that usually always need to lead to a match. And I don't think Shawn Michaels is going to be wrestling. And he's definitely not going to be on TV every single week furthering these storylines. I'm sure that after Raw, uh, he might be gone for uh, a while again until WrestleMania comes along and he starts showing back up. But I think Shawn Michaels, this is just one of his appearances, and I can't see him starting a whole new, you know, big, long storyline by him turning turning heel. It would be perfect. I mean, if Triple H and Stephanie start, uh, you know, acquiring a corporation, acquiring allies, you know, Shawn Michaels would be the perfect guy. I mean, just with the history of him and Triple H, but, you know, where Shawn is in his life and his career, you know, a heel turn for him at this point, three years after he retired, would just make no sense. So I'm pretty sure if Daniel Bryan wins, Shawn Michaels is going to have something to do with it, which could easily lead to Triple H storming out on Raw, all pissed off, and tries to void the whole title match again, or make a rematch, or put Daniel Bryan in another situation with Randy Orton, who knows. But if, just if, Randy Orton is going to win this title, the only way I can see it possible is if the big show goes heel. He's still not explaining how he can get into the building with a fucking Mack truck. He's still not explaining how he can get on the Titan Tron. Uh, so you have to wonder, I've mentioned several times that this is probably Vince McMahon has something to do with this. But what if it's not? What if it's just some big fucking ruse uh, by the McMahons to, you know, get Daniel Bryan to think that Big Show is on his side. Big Show comes out during the Hell in the Cell for some reason uh, to interfere in the match, and he ends up turning on Daniel Bryan, helping Randy Orton win the title, and then Big Show stands in the ring on Monday Night Raw in the opening segment in a suit and tie with Stephanie and Triple H and Randy Orton. And the Shield, for that matter, you know, they could really build themselves an army uh, and use the Big Show, who's just had a ton of history with Triple H and, and, and as a heel and a babyface and all of that. I, I wouldn't mind them going in that direction at all. Now, before you get all uppity, don't give me shit in the comments section. Oh, good mic work. That would never happen. This and that. I'm not saying it's going to happen. These are just ideas. This happened in my last commentary. Some of the stuff I was saying, people were like, oh, I can't believe you think that's going to happen. You're not fucking listening. I didn't say I think it's going to happen. I'm just saying it's a fucking possibility. And I guarantee you, in creative, every fucking option is looked at. So Big Show going heel is definitely an option. But I'm still standing by my prediction. Daniel Bryan walks out of hell in the cell uh, with the WWE title. And you've got 20 thousand people's yesing their asses off. The other title match, like I just said, has huge implications on this title match. I don't think you want to overshadow Daniel Bryan's big moment with a John Cena title win. That's why I'm picking Alberto Del Rio. I'm probably going to be wrong on this prediction, but I would like for some way, not necessarily Alberto Del Rio to win, but Alberto Del Rio to come out of Night of Champions with the title. If he's going to continue feuding with John Cena, fine. They can feud at Survivor Series, they can feud at TLC, they can feud wherever the fuck they want. But if you're going to give the title to Daniel Bryan in the main event, 
John Cena does not need to be holding up the world title earlier on in the show. The outcome of this match is going to tell a great deal about the outcome of the Hell in the Cell. And we're going to know the outcome. I'm guessing, you know, second to last match or middle of the card or something like that, John Cena is going to have this world title match. And if he does not win the title, you can all but guarantee Daniel Bryan will win it. If John Cena does win the title earlier on in Hell in the Cell, then the main event is fucking up for grabs. If John Cena winds up beating Alberto Del Rio and becoming world heavyweight champion, then my prediction is going to change, and I'm going to completely expect Randy Orton to win the title as well. Now, you guys know how I feel about John Cena. I don't hate him. I never have. I don't think there's any reason to. And I have absolutely no problem if the WWE wants to put the world title back on John Cena. No problem at all. But just don't do it at this pay-per-view. I want this to be Daniel Bryan's moment. If it's not, then I'll be back up here saying that Survivor Series will be his moment. But it's to the point now, uh, you know, since SummerSlam, since all the shit that's happened to Daniel Bryan, all the matches that he and Randy Orton have had, this needs to wrap up. What better blow-off can you have than a fucking Hell in the Cell? So I'm hoping that Daniel Bryan just wins this title at Hell in the Cell and then either has a different opponent for Survivor Series or wrestles in a team event. So it should be interesting to say the least. What the hell else do we have going on in Hell in the Cell? I don't even know. Triple threat tag team title match between the Usos, The Shield, and uh, Rhodes and Goldust. Uh, I gotta predict a winner there. Uh, I guess I'll keep it on Cody and Goldust. They just won the fucking things. Why take them off? If they want to uh, make the tag team titles more significant and focus more on the tag team division, then you don't need to have two-week title reigns. So go ahead and keep it on Cody and Goldust. I'm all for that. I predict them to win. Ryback, CM Punk, Paul Heyman in the cell. Got to go with CM Punk. I think Biggie Langston might show his face in this thing somewhere since they're teasing that. Uh, I think that uh, CM Punk finally maybe gets his hands on Paul Heyman and finally ends this nonsense with him. But again, just like in this match, you know, you got to have to watch the card to see, you know, how the main event is going to go. If CM Punk beats the shit out of Ryback and Paul Heyman in the Hell in the Cell, gets his revenge on Paul Heyman, and then John Cena wins the World Heavyweight title, that's too much, and Cody Rhodes and Goldust retain their titles, that's too much good stuff happening on one show. If all of that happens, and you got babyface win after babyface win after babyface win, by the time you get to that main event, you really got to expect Randy Orton to win that title. We also have a Divas title match. I don't give a shit about Brie Bella versus AJ. Uh, God, I love AJ. She's so fucking hot. But I, I, I hope she get. I guess I hope she keeps the title because she's a really good little spunky heel that doesn't take any shit from these fucking total diva girls. But they're trying to make AJ look like the heel and Brie Bella being the babyface. But they're all fucking bitches, as far as you ask me. So whoever wins, I don't care. You can have a title change. Is AJ gonna keep it? Uh, Fuck it, I'm picking AJ, uh, and I'll probably be wrong, but I don't give a shit because I don't give a shit about the match, and I probably won't watch it either. Just notice the Intercontinental title is going to be defended on the pre-show, so Biggie Langston is getting a title shot against Curtis Axel, so, you know, slow down, WWE, pump the brakes. I know you want to push this guy. I like Biggie. He's big. He's athletic. He's got a great look to him. If you want to make him babyface, fine. But don't turn him face one week and then give him the Intercontinental title the next week. Can you just make us wait a little bit? Same goes with Damian Sandow, for that matter. I never mentioned his possibility of cashing in the money in the bank at the John Cena-Del Rio uh, match. But if Damian Sandow is recently turned babyface, I don't know if you want his moment to come yet. So just, you know, settle down, relax, take it fucking slow. What's the goddamn rush? And that's another thing we should think about for the main event. As you're watching Hell in the Cell, if John Cena winds up beating Alberto Del Rio and then Damian Sandow comes in and cashes the the briefcase in on him man that's a lot fucking going on that's technically going to be three title changes in one show because we don't have a, a wwe champion so you know there's going to be a new champion crown there uh then if john cena beats alberto del rio you got a new champion crown there and then if damian sandow comes out and cashes in the briefcase you got another fucking world champion crown so you don't need all this shit that's why i'm hoping del rio somehow by hook or crook or something just fucking happens uh and del rio walks out of that pay-per-view with the belt somehow so just to recap, I'm picking Daniel Bryan to win the WWE title, CM Punk to beat Ryback and Heyman in the cell, Cody Rhodes and Goldust to retain the WWE tag team titles. I predict AJ Lee holds on to the Divas title because I do not believe Brie Bella is over as a babyface at all. And I predict that John Cena and Biggie Langston both win their matches but do not win the title. I hope something happens to John Cena screwing him out of the title, which gives him another shot at it down the road. And I hope that Biggie Langston just does something where he's not winning the Intercontinental title at the pre-show. So either way, no matter what they do, I think we can all agree that Hell in a Cell is shaping up to be a lot better pay-per-view than Battleground. I was disgusted with Battleground. The only thing worse than Battleground was Bound for Glory. 
with any luck, I will be up here Sunday night watching the pay-per-view live. As of right now, I don't have any plans, so I should be able to be home watching the pay-per-view, tweeting. So I will be back up here in a week's time following the post Hell in the Cell Raw and talk about everything that we saw, and I'm really interested to see who our world champions are going to be. So enjoy Hell in the Cell. Let me know what you think of my crazy-ass predictions, and I will talk to you next week. Peace.